Welcome to Chemistry 111. Uh, for uh, this chat, the sorry, today we're going to continue Chapter 11, discussing some of the various things we can do with the ideal gas law, and then go into some of the real gas stuff. Uh, but before that, talk about a few things of business. Uh, don't forget there is. I know there's going to be very topical. Makes sense it, watching this video too late, but this Wednesday they're having a vaccination clinic at the VLO. If you'd like to get the your first COVID vaccination shot, Moderna, you can sign up for that now. It's this Wednesday. Easy chance to get that, get that out of the way. Help us get back to the nearly normal we're hoping for next semester. But we're not going to have to do as much of this nonsense. We're going to be safe. Quick reminder for those in lab that you should be doing the online labs. We have three weeks, four weeks left. The online labs are not just if you've missed a lab. Online labs are part of the lab thing. You have to do three of them. They don't typically take that long, but some of them do require you to think a little bit in advance. Like, plan like sometimes it's like you need a couple hours or you need a few pieces of material maybe you have to get some from me in lab so you take a look at them figure it out but they're not made to be very hard <sighs> quick reminder so far we've learned how to compare pressures volumes temperatures and We've learned how to use the ideal gas equation. And we've also you learned that the sum of various gas pressures is equal to the total pressure. So if I have gas one and I have gas two, the total pressure that we feel is actually the sum of gas one and gas two because of the whole ideal gas relationship. Okay, so one other thing we can do with the ideal gas equation is either determine the molar mass or the density of a gas. This is the one time the ideal gas equation where the identity of the gas actually matters. And no other time will, at least not, in any ideal gas problem, the identity of the gas does not matter because it's just PV equals NRT. The N is just straight up moles. So unless you're given grams, there's no way of really differentiating one gas from the other here. So density, remember, is a mass over a volume. Well, another way to look at a mass is moles times molar mass. So rearranging the equation, we can get that density equals moles times molar mass over volume. And now rearranging our ideal gas equation, moles over volume is equal to pressure times RT. As we see down here. Now, if we take both sides and multiply it by molar mass, we exchange the moles over moles times molar mass over volume to get a density. So essentially, we're saying the density of a gas is equal to the pressure, the temperature, and the molar mass. This is the way we can calculate that, oh, air or whatever, the density of air is 22. Well, you can figure out what is the density of air, and you can use this thing, this equation to realize why does hot air float? Why does hot air rise and cold air fall? Look in here. Kept at similar pressures, air's molar mass will not change. Temperature will change. If the temperature is high, we're dividing by a big number. If the temperature is low, we're dividing by a smaller number. So if the temperature is high, the density is lower. 
and air, the hot air floats. If the temp temperature is low, we're dividing by a bigger, a smaller number, the density is bigger, and so it sinks. Hot air rises, uh, I think, a lab, an online lab dealing with this. But looking from here, just a quick practice. At standard temperature and pressure, what is the density of one mole of xenon gas? Remember, standard temperature and pressure is zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere. So looking at this, what is the density? Doc cam, pull up the doc cam. Okay, zero degrees. We have to turn this into Kelvin or else we're gonna have a problem. So this is 273 Kelvin. Density equals pressure over RT times molar mass. Well, pressure is one. R is 0 0.08206 and T is 273. And so we need, all we need to find out is the molar mass of xenon. Molar mass of xenon, you pull up the periodic table, you go, oh, it's 131.3. 131.3. One times 131.3 divided by 0 0.08206 and divided by 273. You get a density of 5.85. Now, I'm thinking, well, that seems incredibly high. It seems incredibly high. Isn't water one? Would that mean that xenon sinks in water? The answer is no, it still floats because we got to consider the units. This is ATM. This is grams per mole and the big thing is R is ATM liters per mole Kelvin so instead of being grams per milliliter which is the density of liquid water the density of this would be grams over liters grams over liters so meaning if I turn this and compare this to water water is one gram per milliliter and the other one would be 0 0.00585 grams per milliliter. So xenon is, in fact, much, much lighter than water, all things considered. Now, you could take the, I don't have a problem on there, but I'm sure we'll look at one within a day or so when we look at the uh, practice, not just practice, but also on the achieve homework. But you could easily, if you're given a density, calculate for the molar mass. You just would have to rearrange. You would say density times R times T divided by pressure. So... One way or the other, you can find. So the kinetic molecular theory of gases. So we're actually going to try to approximately explain why the ideal gas law works. So the ideal gas law, remember, technically, ideal gas law is just an observation without explanation. We're saying that constant temperature Pressure is indirectly proportional to volume. No clue of why that happens, just that it happens. It's an observation without an explanation. Well, the theory will attempt to explain that. So the idea that gases, we're going to have these five major statements here. Gases contain a large number of molecules 
and or atoms that are in continuous random motion. This is all statements that apply to ideal gases in order to work for the equation. The total volume of all gases stacked atom to atom is negligible in comparison to the volume. So essentially we're gonna make the assumption that the volume of the gases, the gas particles are zero. They're, they're, they're a rounding error. We're going to say the attract pulsive forces between the gases are negligible. So they don't have anti intermolecular interactions other than bouncing into each other. Those statement two and statement three are basic, are simple statements of what it means to be an ideal gas. But the new statements here, especially four and five, is that energy can be transferred via collisions. But the average for all molecules does not change. So billiard balls bouncing around when a fast ball hits a, a slow ball, some of the energy is transferred from the fast and it slows down and some of the energy is gained by the slow and it speeds up. But the average energy of motion does not change. And then finally, the average kinetic energy is proportional to the temperature, regardless of what the gas is. So you heat up a gas, it goes faster. You, you cool down a gas, it goes slow down with energy that is below the temperature. All these five statements are needed to properly understand the ideal gas equation, the kinetic molecular theory. So it says, well, remember, pressure is a collision of fast-moving gas particles. That Boyle's law states a number of, at a constant temperature, which means a constant average energy and speed, there's an average number of collisions within a given time and a given volume. If the volume were to increase, then the, the gas would have to travel farther to hit the wall. And so the rate of collisions would thus pressure would decrease. So changing the volume the would decrease the pressure because the gas particles would have to move farther in order to ricochet off the container. Charles Law stated that temperature was related to volume. So if I can increase the temperature, it means the kinetic energy goes up and thus the speed of a gas goes up. Uh, so you're going you should technically have more collisions should have more collisions to so if i double the volume but double the speed we would have the same amount of collisions because the gas particles can reach from end to end at the same rate then avogadro's law if the number of molecules increase, so must the number of collisions. All that when it comes to thinking about collisions and the speed. Now, individual gas molecules will technically be moving at different speeds based on the kinetic energy. If the kinetic energy is the same, but how do we measure kinetic energy? Well, we're not gonna actually do this in class, from physics, we know kinetic energy is one half mass times velocity. So to hit with a strength, a semi truck will be moving much slower than say like a, a pickup truck to hit with the same amount of force just because mass times velocity squared. Heavier mass means you can move at a slower speed and hit with the same amount of force. Now, all gas molecules won't be moving at the same speed. We're gonna be moving at a average speed based on a, a energy distribution model, kind of like a bell curve. Now, basically, looking at here,
Well, as we increase the temperature, this bell curve shifts over. The whole thing doesn't just uh, shift over because we're going to still have slow molecules. It just now we have a greater distribution at higher speeds. So the, the bell curve flattens out. So we'll, the average energy is right here at 1,000 instead of, say, 500. And the max speed is somewhere close to 3,000 instead of, say, 1,500. Now, uh, there's various ways to calculate kinetic energy average, including the re root mean square. We will not actually do this root mean square on the test. We might, there might be a problem on the homework. I will look at it with you. But the root mean square essentially is a way of calculating the, the average kinetic energy in any gas sample. That the velocity of particles position possessing the average kinetic energy. Looking at the velocity of a gas is equal to the square root of 3 times r times t over molar mass. Now, if this is on the homework, question might be. Note, root mean square velocity is in units of meters per second. It's a classic metric physics unit, meters per second. Now, in order for that to work, we need r to be kilograms meters squared per second squared mole Kelvin. So R, which is equal to a joule per mole Kelvin. So this is the one time R is 8.14. Not 0 0.08, not 0 0.0, not 0 0.08314 or 0 0.08206, but 8.314. You'll and then molar mass, because of that, will have to be not grams per mole, but kilograms per mole. Meaning if you had xenon, which we said was 131.3 grams per mole, that would be 0 0.1313 kilograms in a mole. The reasoning behind this, if kilograms and moles cancel out and the temperature cancels out Kelvin, you would have the square root of meter squared per second squared. That would simplify meter squared square root goes to meters. Square root of second squared goes to seconds. So the units you have left behind when all is said and done is meters per second. It's a way to find what is the average velocity of the gap. Now, where this gets used more often than not is effusion. Sometimes it's diffusion, but effusion more often. Diffusion occurs when the radiated volume of gas expands and mixes within a large gas. So gas gets created in one little area and it spreads out throughout the entire room. Now, the diffusion speeds will depend on the root mean squared velocity, but what makes it harder is you also have to consider the mean free path. Basically, how many gas particles does it have to bump through? If you're trying to get from one side of a room to another and the room is empty, you're gonna have an easy time to get to the other side. However, if the room is crowded, you're gonna have to be bumping through people. You're gonna have to, excuse me, pardon me. You might, like there's a big clump of people talking here. You might have to go around them Oftentimes, the path is not from one side to the other. So it is a lot harder to actually calculate. What is easier to calculate is effusion rates. Effusion, whether you know the term or not, is the expansion of a gas through a small hole based on pressure differentials. Basically, you have gas at high pressure on one side, gas at lower pressure on the other side, and the gas on the will escape out. Technically, this could be used to be a leaky cylinder, but one way to look at it that you'll probably understand better is a balloon. Balloons 
even the best of them have small microscopic holes in them. We try to make it as, as perfect as possible, but there will be small little atomic size holes. Now, balloons at high pressure will naturally be higher than the outside pressure. So balloons by nature will go flat over time depending on the quality of the balloon material. It will escape through whatever little holes there are because the gas particles are gonna bounce around, bounce around, bounce around. And one of them every so often is gonna hit that hole just right to bullseye goes right in, sinks through the pocket and escapes the outside. Now, because the outside pressure is lower, the likelihood of the gases bouncing around will hit that hole and go back in is less likely. And so this is independent of the mean free path because we're not looking at one particle, we're looking at all the particles on a hole. Now, typically what we're gonna look at is not the speed of one gas, but a comparison of rates. You look at how fast does gas A diffuse with respect to gas B. We're gonna compare whatever rate one is versus rate two. Now, because of this, because of the nature of this, we will only look at the square root of molar mass two over molar mass one. Because what we're looking at is it only depends Velocity of one over the velocity of two would be the same as rate one over rate two. Or well, velocity one is square root RT over molar mass one. The velocity of two is square root RT over molar mass two. If same, they cancel out. And so the equation simplifies to the rate one over rate two is the square root of molar mass two over molar mass one. Now helium, for example, has a molar mass of four grams per mole. Air, the average mole is about 28. If we look at the rate of those two, square root of 28 over four, you're gonna get a number that is less than one, or greater than one. It's like square root of seven, It's like 2.64, meaning a helium balloon will at 2.64 five times you with your breath. That much faster than when you feel with your breath, fill with your breath. Because looking at this, look at the little chart. It's a little hard to see. But you see here, here's the average distribution of hydrogen. See hydrogen, the smallest gas, has this really wide bell curve where it's going very fast and some very slow. Helium, the bell curve goes a little bit smaller. Then you get nitrogen and oxygen, almost the same. Then chlorine and krypton over here. Meaning because these gases are heavier, they move slower to have the same kinetic energy. They move slower to have the same kinetic energy because they are heavier gases. Hydrogen, which is lighter, thus is gonna have more kinetic, is gonna have, be moving faster. It'll be able to diffuse quicker. So just a quick thing, at 100 degrees C, what is the root mean square velocity of steam? And how much faster will it diffuse compared to oxygen? Now, once again, I'm not gonna ask you the root mean square velocity at, on the test, but the fusion is all fair game. Fusion is really easy. Root mean square velocity has a couple tricks in it that you must watch out for. Okay, so the root mean square velocity is equal to square root of three R P over molar mass. 
the temperature. So we're going to add 273. So T is 373. R is, oh, sorry. R is 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Kilograms, meters squared. And water is 18 grams per mole, which means 0 0.018 kilograms in one mole. So we have square root of 3 times 8.314 times 373 or 0 0.018. So I'm going to do all the values within the parentheses for within the square root first, just so you know where I'm at. And then I'll do the square root. So I get a really big number, square root of 516853.7. And I'll square root that. And you get a value 718.9 meters per second. I know that seems fast, but got, remember, this is gases we deal with. This is gases. We don't have a concept of what is fast for a gas. So it's really hard to judge what is fast gas. That is a normal, perfectly normal for a gas. Now, the easy one is what is the rate of water versus the rate of oxygen? Well, that's going to be the square root of molar mass of oxygen over molar mass of water. So rearranging square root of oxygen. One oxygen is 16. Two oxygens are 32. Do you read them in kilograms per mole? No, because the units of this will be identical to the units of this. The grams per mole and grams per mole will cancel out and give us unitless. So the square root of 32 over 16, 32 over 18, sorry, is 1.3, repeating. Steam will escape through a hole 1.3, repeating times faster than oxygen. So, Well, the 33% faster, but 1.3. Typically, this number is going to be greater than 1. This number is typically going to be greater than 1, which is how we set up most of the equations. So don't be tripped up there. Four thirds, which is. Now, however, this last little bit, real gases. We have to deal with real gases. We're never going to have ideal gases. I mean, not in the long run, because get an ideal gas assumes this will stay a gas at all temperatures. At all temperatures. Last problem we just dealt with was oxygen and water at 100 degrees. We know water boils at 100 degrees, so it remains a vapor. What would happen if you started cooling down that water vapor to below 100, maybe down to 80, right? maybe down to 70? What would start happen? That water vapor would suddenly start condensing into a liquid. It no longer becomes a gas. Now, oxygen would stay a gas but you keep cooling down. 
you pressurize, you keep pushing it together and cooling it down. You could freeze out the oxygen. You could condense out the oxygen to liquid oxygen. That's a danger. Sometimes you have to be careful that when you put things at, say, liquid nitrogen temperatures, you always get some liquid oxygen, which could, it was well, very flammable, among other things. But you, you could condense out various gases. They have, uh, will happen. So an ideal gas will assume that doesn't happen. But because of the intermolecular attractions and the fact that these gases do have volumes, the ideal gas problem will not work for situation. Said we assume we have no volume and no attractive forces. This works well for low pressures and high enough temperatures. But when we get to pressures above 10 atmospheres, we'll start to see some serious deviations. So like, for example, using a high pressurized steam pipe, or you're talking about like pressures in uh, like highly pressurized cylinders, we could actually see some major deviation depending on what gas it is. Now, I in real gases, we will actually differentiate between gas A and gas B. Those guys will have different deviations because some gases are bigger than others. Some gases have more attractive forces than others, and we have to take account for that. Uh, so we will consider the intermolecular forces known as the van der Waals force. We will talk about forces more next semester, but the van der Waals force is a generic force that just concludes all the types of forces out there. We talked about dipole interactions it, when we talk bonds and bonding. We talk about ionic interactions when we talked about like aqueous reactions. Well, there's dipole, dipole, there's hydrogen bonding, there's what we call dispersion forces. All of these just fall into the generic category of van der Waals force. We're just saying all the forces put together are all van der Waals forces. And so when we look at this, we're just summing them all up rather than looking at each one individually. Now, once again, this is a complicated equation. I'm not really gonna ask much about this on the test, at least not the direct application of this equation. There might be some homework problems about this, but in itself, we are not gonna ask about this on the test. Now, obviously, this is discovered by Johannes van der Waals. Uh, yeah, we already said that. Uh, let's say. Now, he made this modified gas equation. Remember, the gas equation was PV equals nRT. Well, he modified this with pressure plus the moles of gas squared times the constant A over the volume squared. That accounts for the attractive forces, the attractive forces. The more gas molecules divided by the volume, so essentially the density of the gas times the constant. How many gas molecules versus how many volume? More gas molecules means there's gonna be more interaction, but larger volume means there's gonna be less interaction. So we can look at how the pressure is going to increase or decrease depending on the amount of moles or the amount of volume. Typically, the, the pressure is going to go down with, with that. Now, uh, then the volume, we have to account for the actual size of the gas. So volume is volume minus the moles times the constant B. So when we think of the actual volume for the gas equation, we're thinking about the available volume for the gas molecules to move around. So we have to subtract out how much size do the actual gas molecules go around. Constant A and constant B are, depend from gas to gas. But however, we will never memorize them. There's no way to really memorize them. All you need to know is like how to use this, if even that. It will be given on the homework. It will be given 
on any situation that you need to use it. If you can't find it on the homework, there's usually on the hint. Click the hint and it'll show you or you go to a table and you can look it up. But real quick, the last problem we'll do. Two moles of CO2, how would it deviate under, from ideal gas at 12 ATM and three liters? So what would the temperature deviation be? I'm gonna write down our A is 3.59 and our B is 0.0427. So looking at this, okay. First, what is our ideal gas temperature? PVO equals NRT. If we're looking for the temperature, P, V over N, R equals T. So pressure, 12 ATM. Volume, three liters. N, two moles. And R, 0 0.08206 ATM liters per mole Kelvin. 12 times 3 divided by 2 divided by our R. The temperature that that gas would be predicted to be at under ideal conditions would be 219. Let's say 219.4, which in terms of temperature would be negative 53 degrees Celsius. That'd be what CO2 would be. Now, P plus N squared A over V squared, V minus NB, RT, well, NRT. Rearranging that, you'd have, divide both sides by NR, you'd have all that divided by NR. So I'm gonna treat each part individually just to avoid confusion. So P plus N squared over V squared A. So pressure, 12 atmospheres, plus two squared over three squared, three liters moles, times our A, which is 3.59 ATM liters per liter squared per mole squared. Liter squared and mole squared cancel out. To leave ATM, so four times five nine divided by nine. The actual pressure would be thirteen point five nine. We'll say six. Atmospheres. The volume, so B is going to be what? Three liters minus two moles times our B, which is 0 0.0427 liters per mole. So three, two times 0 0.0427. The actual volume is 2.9146 liters. So plugging those in, we have 13.596 times divided by two moles and RR. Five nine six times two point nine one four six. You get a temperature of two forty one point four five, or negative thirty one degrees point thirty one point five degrees. So. That's almost like 20 degrees difference. Cal just calculating right there based on uh, 
real versus ideal. And even then, that this equation isn't perfect. There's ways to further perfect that equation, but that is neither here nor there. That in mind, that is the last slide of material. We are done. We are done, done, done. That is all we got. We will, we will continue to review tomorrow, not tomorrow, but Wednesday, we will continue by looking at the achieve. Achieve the last little bit of homework for the ideal gas chapter. It's broken into two parts. The first part is seven questions all about learning about uh, conversion, con converting between different pressures, uh, the relationships of the PV1, P1, V1 equals P2, V2, or V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2, the various relationships like that, and using the ideal gas equation just straight up utilization of the gas laws and the gas equation. Uh, the part two is when we start to look at Dalton's law of partial pressures, start to look at density and molar mass, look at effusion rates, root mean square velocities, and uh, maybe some real gases. I don't think that one's too small, too, too long, but it is a wide variety of different types of problems. But remember, for the test, we're not going to worry about root mean square velocity, and we're not going to worry about actually utilizing the real gas equation. So but we, get, we have what, like chat, we have uh, stoichiometry, we have thermodynamics and we have gases. So tomorrow, we'll I mean, not tomorrow, but Wednesday, we'll be looking at the achieve and probably start on reviewing the old exam. We'll probably continue reviewing the old exam, maybe Friday, and prepare for a test next week. I'm currently almost done writing the test. I have the same thing in person kind of test. You can have a cheat sheet, whatever notes you want on the sheet of notebook paper. Just take your time, write it out. Make sure you have a calculator. Some of the previous tests, you would not need a calculator. You could be just fine. This one, if you do not have a calculator, you will have a really bad time. So make sure you come prepared, plan that out. I'm going to go ahead and call class a little bit early rather than try to fiddle around with uh, trying to get Achieve working. With that in mind, thank you for your time.